So everybody, this is uh, Andre Tsaletka uh, from the RIPE NCC. Actually, uh, before that, uh, Andre worked at Cessnet and I always uh, met Andre at uh, RIPE conferences. And, uh, but uh, you, you're in the uh, learning and development team of the RIPE exactly. NCC. So involved with uh, training sessions, uh, etc. And uh, you've. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll talk about uh, setting up the lab environments uh, for those uh, exactly. training sessions. Exactly. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, thank you very much for introduction. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Andrzej Zaletka. I'm originally, originally from Czechia, but I have moved to Netherlands in March 2020. So you can just imagine what happened just when I moved, but it's not my fault. Uh, and yeah, unfortunately, my Dutch is still very bad. So, and as you hear, my English is also not that good as typical Dutch person. But yeah, bear with me. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, in this talk, I will be. This will be really like not a big rocket science, uh, not anything in a cloud. I will actually use a picture that I already saw today once on someone else's slide. It's a pure coincidence. Uh, it will be mostly about how you can combine tools in a way to make something uh, uh, to make to make some to make something new with the tools that are available because that's my usual workflow to combine available tools if possible open source tools to do some to make something that is uh, that, that is that is like not not uh, that wasn't there before to be precise so first i'm going to a little bit introduce myself or my department which i work in so ripe ncc i'm not sure if i have to introduce but ripe ncc is an association of uh, basically isps around europe uh, that uh, is uh, working as a registry there are the internet is divided into five regional internet registries ripe ncc is one, one of it it's an association based in amsterdam and uh, for our members, we do uh, many services, and one of them are uh, learning and development, uh, which is the department I work for, which used to be called training services because we provided training to our members. But uh, we, uh, ever since that, uh, developed a little bit further. So uh, we, do, we do not only face-to-face -face trainings, which we had to stop for, COVID and then we restarted it this year so it's like a, again a new thing for many many our members which are new maybe uh, but we also do webinars we did webinars even before COVID so if, <laughs> when it was not cool and now uh, everybody is doing it and uh, the thing we have and think that I would like to stress uh, here because maybe uh, most of you are not uh, RIPE NCC members or are associated with members uh, Webinars and face-to-face -face are members only, but we have this thing called RIPE NCC Academy, which is free for everyone, which is basically e-learning platform based on Moodle, uh, where our curated content is available to anybody on the internet, and you can, you can learn about networking stuff uh, without, uh, without uh, needing to go anywhere, just in your own pace. You can, uh, you can read, you can watch videos, and it's made like I have lots of colleagues that are experts in the uh, learning and education uh, techniques, so you you cannot expect that it will be slide full of full of text or something like that, or just uh, uh, dull text. There are lots of animations, lots of uh, structured uh, text, lots of uh, refreshments, so you can test that the knowledge actually is there and all those things that, that people do to make uh, the, the learning experience proper. Yeah, and the last thing we have is also certified professionals. It's the program that if you have the knowledge that you get from us, you can get certified and you can get this digital badge. You will also get t-shirt like I have. And uh, this is like something that we do in a also sort of innovative way. I haven't seen this uh, approach before, but it works like instead of going anywhere, you just uh, stay at home and you are observed via webcam uh, that you are indeed the one who is sitting in the computer. You don't get any help from anybody. So then your certificate actually is issued to you. The biggest problem here is that you have to clean your room 
because <laughs> because they 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 ask you to put everything off the desk. So if you live in a small apartment or share apartment, it's really hard to find such a room. Uh, oh, LIRs, yeah, LIRs are well. Uh, in theory, it's, they are members of uh, RIPE and CC. So basically, uh, the internet works in hierarchy. On the top, there is IANA, Internet Assigned Number Authority. It's divided into five regional internet registries, and those regional internet registries further divide the resources into local internet registries. So LIR. Um, it's, 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 there's a slight difference between members and LIR, but for the purposes of uh, of this presentation, we don't have to de de dig into this detail because this is not what I'm going to talk about. This was just an introduction. What I'm going to talk about is that for this e-learning, uh, we have um, two new recent e-learning courses. First is called IPv6 Security, and second is called BGP Operations and Security. And these e-learnings are new in a way that they come with hands-on labs. And that was the task for me to figure out how we can how we can make our participants uh, play with some networking stuff um, possibly in a way because this is the service that we offer free for everybody so uh, possibly in a way that will not incur some uh, excessive costs to us or a cost per user because that would be something uh, that uh, probably our members which are funding us we are funded by our members we are not for profit uh, would not like to see that we just are wasting money or uh, on providing such service. So, uh, so uh, that was that was the idea. And here you see basically the very simple network that we use for this training of IPv6 security. We have basically three hosts running Linux on a common network segment. And the idea here is that one host is like attacker, second host is victim, and the third host is observer who is watching what is happening on the wire. And then the, we have the whole training course about basically run this command on host A, uh, look what happens on host B, and lo look how a packet looks like on, uh, by observing host C. So this was the first, this was the first uh, hands-on lab that we did for uh, the academy. Uh, for uh, for the next course, which went actually live on Friday, so it's very very recent. Uh, it's called BGP Operations and Security, and this is much more close to some networking environment because there are actual routers. There are 11 routers in in this lab, and uh, also one server running Linux, which we use to practice RPKI uh, validation, which is a thing that uh, is used uh, on internet to uh, secure the routing basically with BGP. That's what that's what this uh, lab is about. So this is much bigger fun rega regarding in how many resources you have to put into the lab. Yeah, and then I was already um, I was already a little bit uh, talking about it. Uh, the uh, question here is how to deliver such uh, lab into uh, to users without without something that is like you know. In the ideal world, it would be universal scalable. So if we uh, launch a new training course and there will be hundred concurrent users at the same time, we should not uh, we should not like uh, 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 deplete our resources. And at the same time, it should not cost too much money. It can cost something, but it should be reasonable. And also, some problems with such labs that are sometimes offered in a hosted basis is that. They are time limited. You basically get a voucher for Amazon Web Services that will allow you to play with environment for an hour, and after an hour, it will everything will be destroyed. Uh, and we also often have this uh, when we did lab during face to face. People were asking, "Can I just save the config, or can I play with it at home because I didn't have time during the training course?" So we would like to offer people to play with it as long as they want, and of course, it should be easy to use. And so, we uh, so uh, even though cloud would be would be a solution to most of this problem, except for the money problem, uh, uh, we started with this first approach. Like, what if we just deliver a virtual machine image? Basically, the computers are now pretty capable. Uh, you know, so so you can run a VM on a decent uh, five-year-old computer pretty easily. 
So it's not like it's not like that. Uh, and many people already have it. And the nice thing about uh, running things on users' computers is that uh, it's unlimited. There, there's unlimited scalability. The more users you have, the more hardware you have to run it on. So basically, you never reach reach, uh, reach a scalability issue. Uh, of course, it has some drawbacks. Uh, the drawback is that. Uh, basically, we have sort of like three major operating system. If I count only desktop computers, well, the drawback that I didn't didn't uh, mention here is that there are lots of people now not using desktop computers at all. They are just happy with their tablets and mobile phones running Android or iOS, and with that, it's a challenge. But let's stick to that. People still have like normal computers. And there are three platforms. There is Windows, there is Linux, and there is Mac OS. Uh, each of them provides virtualization, but uh, each of them uh, take a little bit different approach. And uh, so, uh, and uh, it's always hard to like support all three of them. Uh, so the here the common solution is VirtualBox which is uh, one of the worst hypervisors, I would say. But at the same time, it's one app that looks exactly the same on all three platforms. So, uh, so that makes it much easier for supporting a solution. And uh, as I said, it's suboptimal. So, uh, but it, unless you do some really CPU intense uh, things, uh, it should not matter that much. Another thing with provisioning people with uh, with uh, virtual machine image is that uh, around the world keyboards change, screen resolution change. So uh, the basic idea was that we provide an image that would be actually that would actually have a graphical user interface that people would just interact in a window, like if you run a virtual machine. Uh, but this was exactly the case. Like somebody has a big monitor, somebody has a small, uh, small laptop screen, and uh, you have to figure out that uh, each user should be able to change DPI on their on their virtual machine so they can they can see it, they can read it. Uh, with keyboard layout, it's the same problem because yeah, we don't have only QWERTY. We have also I'm from the country where QWERTY is the thing, and there are even weirder things like AZERTY. Uh, is there somebody from Belgium? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just like... <laughs> uh, so, uh, and it's really inconvenient if you cannot type on your layout that you are used to uh, on. Uh, so, uh, the solution here is that we actually uh, not use the VM, uh, VM uh, console at all. We use the VM just to run a web server, which you access over loopback via redirected port from the host machine. So you use your favorite web, web browser on your computer with your operating system, your keyboard layout, your screen resolution, everything is yours. And you just access a local host on port 8080, which is redirected into the VM. And in VM, everything happens via, uh, via this uh, HTTP uh, connection. So this is uh, this is a quite um, nice uh, approach, at least from my point of view. Uh, and then the last bit that is uh, that is to be uh, solved is how you actually make people deploy the VM image, because the way that you provide somebody with uh, V uh, how it's called o -O -V -O -V -A, uh, OVA file. And then they ask them import it into VirtualBox. Next, next, finish. And then you should. Then you have to do this, and then you have to do that. It's too complicated. Uh, so then, uh, well, the idea here was that we will use another tool, which is called Vagrant, and it's a tool uh, mostly used by DevOps people to basically automate, uh, orchestrate creating virtual machines and their life cycles. That means like the very basic things like create virtual machine, um, set up SSH connection between the host and the virtual machine, and then run some provisioning script, which is basically what we need. So uh, so this is, this is uh, before I go into detail, let's look how the final product looks like and what we actually ask our users to do. 
it, it's, uh, it uh, goes down to three steps. So we ask them to install VirtualBox, install Vagrant, and then the hardest part, open terminal and uh, type those two commands, Vagrant in it and Vagrant app, uh, without really explaining what is, what is happening behind the scenes because this is not the point of our uh, training. And then once the, uh, this will basically behind the scenes download a VM image, set it up in a way uh, in a virtual box that it can be run, and then it will redirect port 8080 and run the VM image. And once the VM image boots up, you just open your web browser, point it to localhost port 8080, and you will get to this environment which uh, basically offers you three terminal windows. This is the IPv6 security lab, so there are just three hosts. And you, you have console of three uh, of those three hosts, and you can just interact with them like if you were using a terminal. So this is how the final product looks, looks like. Uh, but of course, here I would like to talk about uh, how this works behind the scene, what is, what is there and uh, why uh, we took some decisions that we, that we took. So let's go a bit deeper. So uh, as a base, there is some Ubuntu, which is like uh, offered, uh, offered uh, in, there is something called Vagrant Cloud, which is basically a storage of prepared uh, VM images and Ubuntu is contributing to this, so they, they are offering uh, VirtualBox images which are with very basic setup of Ubuntu. Uh, Ubuntu has this nice thing called LXD, which is a, I don't know if you can call it hypervisor, but it's, it's a thing that runs containers. So they are not real VMs, but they are containers, which means that they are really efficient in a way uh, of uh, sharing resources, and also containers can be easily run inside VMs. Uh, unlike, you know, nesting VMs is a little bit trickier. Uh, so basically, so basically, inside this Ubuntu VM, we have three containers for these three for these three uh, machines that uh, user is interacting with. Or in case of this BGP security, we have about twelve containers with routers. Uh, yeah, we have, uh, uh, and for that we use actually FRR, which is a uh, open source routing software that is a fork of Quagga. Maybe somebody know uh, Quagga. So FRR is like a maintained and uh, more up to date fork of it. It's running on Alpine Linux, which is a very tiny Linux distribution that has a very small footprint, like 35 megabytes, the whole distribution. So you can then therefore spawn 12 of them and it doesn't uh, really affect the performance or the disk space. Yeah, and uh, then you have the VMs running and you would like to access them from the web browsers. So for that, there is this, uh, there is this tool called TTYD, uh, TTYD and Tmax. I will talk about it a bit more. And then we have, uh, yeah, then we have the everything around, if I go back to this slide, uh, everything around, this is just basically a static HTML and of course, even though it's just static HTML, it took me the most work because I'm not HTML coder and I have no clue how these things like Node.js and uh, Webpacker work. So it's like completely new world for me. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's everything served uh, with NG Nginx on one port. So part of it is static HTML. Other part is just a uh, proxy into the TTYD which is taking care of the, of the terminal console itself. Uh, yeah, and everything that I would just talk about is deployed using Ansible. So basically it starts with the fresh Ubuntu installation and then you just run Ansible with some playbook on it and the, play, the Ansible will do everything. So also I today already heard about like how it's crucial to automate everything if you have uh, things like uh, fire or so. So I would say yes, even, even in this case, uh, this adds a lot of repro reproducibility and also, also um, easier development because if you, if you just do one manual thing here and there and then you say, oh, something is, doesn't work or let's do it again and then you find out you don't know what exactly you have to do. So this uh, everything is done on Ansible and 
everything is publicly available on GitHub of RipenCC. So basically, even though I'm still the only contributor in those uh, in those repositories, uh, I would really likely if if somebody finds an improvement or a bug, if they report it, if they if they if they fix it, I believe that this like this is the best approach to uh, allow open source community, even though we know that the community always needs some uh, force to push and also some money because people will not fix your bug for you. So it's, it's uh, uh, but uh, still better than if you just uh, hold things for yourself. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm a strong proponent of uh, doing things as open as possible. Uh, so now, uh, other part of it, uh, which I find very interesting is that how you get the terminal into web browser so you can interact with the server via your web browser. Uh, I found out that there are actually three uh, pieces of software that do exactly the same. So their choice is a matter of preference, whether you like Go language or Node.js or just C. So I went for C, C version, which is called TYD, but they act uh, almost the same. Basically, uh, all of them are based on a JavaScript project that is called Xterm.js. An Xterm.js is a JavaScript application that runs in your browser and implements Unix terminal. And the only thing that the, these apps are doing is how this terminal is going to be connected, basically the pipe between the terminal that is running in your browser and the, and the actual virtual machine. And for this, the technology that is used is called WebSocket. So WebSocket is basically a way how you switch HTTP slash HTTPS connection into a normal TCP connection. So there's basically a TC, uh, HTTP handshake, after which it will, it will switch into normal TCP tunnel, so arbitrary data can be passed here and there. And that's exactly what happens with, uh, with TTID. So basically, you will get the extern JS to your browser, and then the WebSocket tunnel is established to a pseudo terminal on the, on the virtual machine, and everything is relayed between. Uh, uh, the, uh, also, the thing that is common with all those three, all those three applications here is that for every for every single uh, uh, for every single connection, a new process is spawned. Basically, as I said, there's a there's a pipe between this uh, terminal in your browser and a pseudo terminal. So, what if two people connect together? Of course, two two pipes will be established, and they have to end into two processes. So, these apps are offloading it in a way that uh, they are always they are always making uh, separate uh, spawning more and more instances. And that also means that if the pipe breaks for some reason, for instance, you close your browser, you refresh your browser, whatever, uh, it will uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, program that is running on the on the on the uh, backside is just lost because uh, because the pipe is broken. Uh, so this is a little bit unfortunate. You don't want to have this because. Uh, refreshing browsers or uh, losing uh, web browser connection is something that happens on a regular basis with normal usage and it's not something if you are running web service you should not expect long-term running session even though it's on a loopback so but for that there are common solutions known for from uh, known from uh, Linux or Unix environment they are either screen or tmax yeah, Screen is like a little bit older project from GNU. Tmux is from OpenBSD originally, uh, but ported to Linux as well. And basically these are like terminal multiplexers. That means they, uh, they um, pr present a virtual terminal that can be then attached from multiple processes and all the processes that attach it see the same window. Uh, and it's actually a much more complex task than you Thing, if I'm just explaining it like this, because the there is uh, the the Linux terminal is much more complicated than just characters in, characters out. There are, for instance, some IOCTLs for figuring out window size. 
so the full screen applications can uh, can work uh, can use the window size efficiently uh, there are also there are also um, commands to manipulate with the scrollback buffer so for instance if you if you are typing a commands in console and then you run a full screen app like vim and then you return then you quit it you will return back to the and the scrollback will be preserved even though there was no scrollback when there was a full screen app so there are lots of those corner cases that have to be uh, have to be somehow uh, uh, figured out if you want to share one terminal between uh, many between many clients which is basically what we do for just for this purpose that you if you refresh your browser you will still connect to the same session one of the side effects of sharing this uh, console screen is that tmax is well known for doing this thing that is on this example on the right, that if there are multiple viewports, the smallest will win, and the bigger one will just have the dots filled uh, rest of the screen because there's no way how you can share one screen if they are two different sizes, uh, which is which is annoying, uh, but that's what you can. Uh, uh, there's nothing you can do about it, and. The last thing that I found very annoying, or actually was reported to me by users, is that the way Tmax work uh, will actually mess a lot with your scrollback. That means that basically by default, if you run Tmax, your scrollback buffer is deactivated, and if you turn your wheel and you, or use shift page up to scroll up, you will see nothing. You can you can replace it by native scrollback in Tmax, which is Control B and page up and things like that. But the problem with that is that this is not intuitive. People are not used to it, and people don't want to learn how to operate Tmax. So uh, there are some quirks how to enable native scrollback on Tmax. It has some disadvantages. Uh, the biggest one is that a uh, version of Tmax newer than 2.3 actually has the optimization that if you, for instance, get a long file that is longer than the terminal size, it will only show you the beginning and the end, and it will omit the ways in the middle because it was so fast that you were not able to read it, so why to send it on the terminal? Unfortunately, then you, that means that you scroll back and you're just missing parts of uh, your, your output, so... Um, this is something that uh, right now I work around by downgrading Tmax to 2.3 and I'm wishing that Tmax 2.3 will still be available because I was looking what other, this is basically pretty common setup, so I looked at the Google Cloud console which uses basically the same thing if you open the console in the browser, there is Tmax in it and guess which version of Tmax they use, 2.3. Uh, so, uh, so I wonder. Uh, yeah, of course, the developers of Tmax are pretty strict in saying that this is not a bug. This is actually fixed. It should never work like that. And we will definitely not reintroduce the bug in newer version. But that, yeah, so this is sometimes <laughs> hard. But uh, uh, if we put everything together, so as I said, there's Nginx that works at reverse, pro reverse proxy plus serving static HTML content. And then uh, the reverse proxy is um, uh, communicating with the, with the uh, TTYD processes. Uh, the port 80 is redirected from the host to the VM. User open their browser pointing to redirected port, and that's it. Uh, yeah, so basically this is how, how it works. The rest is basically to install some pro some apps into the VMs and then to uh, ask people to do things like uh, run this command, look what happens, and hoping that uh, this behavior will not change in time, which sometimes did happen, like uh, there was a new version of Linux kernel which changed the way how ICMP v6 redirect were handled, and we, it, it, it hit our um, you know our uh, training course because it it uh, started doing something else than it should. Uh, yeah, but now because this should be mostly about if you want to start something similar, how you should do it, what uh, what uh, you can learn from me, uh, is that I'm going to talk a bit more about the details 
details inside it or how, the, how everything is automated. So, uh, first of all, as I said, Vagrant is a very nice tool that will just help you, uh, help you do the boring parts. That means download VM image, set it up, set up networking for the VM image, redirect port so you can reach it from the host, uh, even exchange SSH, SSH keys so it's reasonably secure. So basically the idea is that all the VM images have, um, uh, are set up in a way that a uh, user can be authenticated using a publicly known SSH key. That means it's insecure. Anybody can authenticate into it. And it's used only for bootstrapping. So as soon as Vagrant starts the VM for the first time, it will replace this, uh, this uh, SSH key with its own pair of uh, keys. So from that from that time on it's it's uh, safe and no one else should be able to log in that vm uh, it also do a nice thing for developers which is shared folder that means that the folder from the host is shared into the into the vm which is very handy if you are developing something and want to use vagrant for uh, automating build for instance or testing uh, then uh, Vagrant can do lots of uh, ways to provision it. So I, had, I was a little bit familiar with Ansible, so I went this way. So basically, Vagrant is able to take care of installing Ansible on the, on the VM. And then once Ansible is installed, it's able to uh, run a, a playbook. So then everything is, everything is inside, the, uh, inside the playbook. Uh, and once the playbook is finished, the VM is ready to be run. Uh, which is good that you can easily develop it because basically every time you make a change, you can always destroy everything and start from scratch. And it takes right now about 10 minutes or so uh, from complete zero to fully set up environment. Uh, so my first idea when I started with this was, this is exactly what I will distribute. I will distribute basically just Ansible playbooks. I will distribute uh, and I will ask people to do this building, just wait uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then just, uh, uh, and that's, that will be it. Uh, but it turned out this is not a good plan because uh, if you are not running your own repository with everything that you need, but you are actually installing things from the internet, it can break in very random ways and you can hardly reproduce it. For instance, in, uh, yeah, in Ripen CC service region, there's also Middle East. And in Middle East, internet works quite differently from what we are used to here. So it's very common and we have had already several support tickets that uh, this Vagrant just doesn't work because it cannot reach the Vagrant cloud because probably you have to use some state-controlled proxy server to reach that destination or so. So uh, in the end, uh, in the end, we do an extra step. So this building phase where Vagrant is running empty image and then use Ansible to provision everything is done only once. And when everything, once everything is done, we actually use Vagrant again to save state of this provisioned image into a new image. And this is the new image that we distribute. So this is how, this is how we distribute the ready-made image. So it's frozen in time and it should work. It, the, even one of the last uh, updates was that I disabled automatic updates of, of, uh, of it because, uh, yeah, unintended updates can break things, like upgrade your Tmax and it stops working the way you expect it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, and then you have just basically, and if you have somebody complaining that they cannot use it, you can still ask them. Maybe you can try the manual way of downloading the big image of two gigabytes from one place, and if it works with your web browser, and if it works, then you can import it manually, and this, this works. So, and to make it even more automated, which is something that I'm a little bit proud of, is that I'm not doing this on my own computer, but actually I'm abusing GitHub Actions for that. 
and it's for free because it's free repository. So uh, somewhere in the cloud, there's this, there's this worker who just spins up a VM that it runs Vagrant, uh, install everything, and after 15 minutes, it will create a nice VM image and upload it to VM uh, to Vagrant Cloud. And this everything happens without my uh, without my presence. All I have to do is just the commit uh, thing into the GitHub repository, and then afterwards, when I check that everything is okay, I just click in Vagrant Cloud that I want this version to be published. Uh, yeah, there are some limitations of Vagrant. Uh, first of all, the boxes, which is the terminus technicus for the, uh, for the VM image in Vagrant, uh, are only for particular hy hypervisors. So if you have a virtual box uh, image, you cannot run it on Hyper-V you cannot run it on uh, on uh, um, what is this uh, KVM? Yes, exactly KVM and others. So you can do it by adjusting and making separate images for each. But uh, this is this is a little bit complicated. Uh, then one thing that bothers me a lot, but most people are completely ignorant to this, is that the networking support is very basic in VirtualBox, the way Vagrant set it up. Actually, VirtualBox can do more, but the way Vagrant set it is, is uh, that there is no IPv6 in the VM, even though VirtualBox is capable of doing IPv6 NAT, which is not the nicest thing to have, but still better than now, no IPv6, but unfortunately, once you start playing with the networking, you will break the way where Vagrant talks to the virtual box, so everything will break, and uh, so there's no easy easy solution to that. And uh, last but not least, and this is uh, bothering me a lot, is that now there is this Apple Silicon things, which is not this thing, but uh, VS Ripe and CC have actually are forced to use Apple hardware, and my colleagues are already using. Uh, Apple Silicon based uh, MacBooks and they just cannot run it because there's no virtual box and it doesn't look like there will be anytime soon. I'm still thinking that you know Apple is a very favorite platform for all the developers so somebody will find an easy to use solution but so far all the solutions were pretty complicated. Uh, so this is something that I'm still looking uh, uh, how to how to fix this because once I replace this this thing with uh, something that is uh, Apple Silicon based, it will just stop working. Yeah, then I have this uh, small demo. I figure, find out that I don't have that much time, so, but I will just show you at least, at least something. Let me try to mirror my screen. Hopefully, it will not break everything. Yes, I think it's big enough. So. Uh, I'm going to show you exactly what we ask users to do. So I just create some folder. I just enter the folder, and then I just uh, issue background in it, uh, ripe ncc slash bgp sec lab. This will basically just prepare uh, a very basic vagrant file which will just uh, instruct Vagrant to download this image of this name from the Vagrant cloud and run it in default configuration, which is exactly what we need. And then I just run Vagrant app, and all those things happen. The only thing that is not going to happen now is it's not going to download the image itself because it's already cached in my computer, so I skip that part that is a little bit lengthy. But now, uh, behind the scene, the nice thing that is actually the virtual box is running unattended, uh, with, without uh, without any uh, how do you call it? No unattended. Uh, the word headless. Thank you very much. Yes, that was the word I was looking for. Uh, so basically, now it's going to uh, set up port forwarding. You you see that there is port 80 forwarded and the port 2022, which is the SSH. Uh, then it will try to. Then it will wait until the machine will boot. After it will boot, it will uh, get into in. Uh, this is the this is the pre-provisioned uh, VM image, so there will be no provisioning happening because it's already the only thing that we need to do here is to is to boot it up. So it will take about 30 more seconds, maybe. 
my laptop now draws 57 watts, so it's doing something, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, demo time. Ah, yeah. So, now it started, and that's basically it. And now I can just open my web browser. And if I open my web browser and navigate to, I will just zoom it in a bit. Navigate to localhost. Yeah, this is basically the environment. Most of it is static HTML. Uh, and you have some, yeah, and there are some workspaces. So for instance, this is like my network. So there are three routers here. Uh, you can even a little bit rearrange it. It should be able to resize this. Win oh, now I press something that I shouldn't have. Uh, okay. Now it's gone. Where is it? Here. Uh, never mind. Uh, yeah, so we have this thing. We have other terminals here. Uh, we have, this is the network diagram, and we have a Linux server here. There is always a scratch pad where you can use for having node, and you can always pop out the window into, into a big window if you want something bigger, and you can zoom it in, of course. So, and it's, it's like normal. That was too much. Uh, yeah, uh, that was a little bit too much. Uh, so basically, you are in, inside the container. You can interact with other containers. Uh, there are network links between them, just like on the on the plan. Uh, the thing here is, as I as uh, as I show you the uh, because the console will always uh, take only the smallest window. Uh, the trick here is that every time you connect from a new session, the old session get disconnected. So you see here now it's detached. And now if I press reconnect, it will connect here, but it will detach from here, and this will be the... Uh, so, so this is the way how uh, you can navigate easily, you can change the window size, and you can... Uh, okay, I don't have much more time, so I will, I will skip, this, uh, uh, skip the rest, but that was basically it, and yeah, the rest is in our academy where you get basically the whole story behind it, like what you need to configure and where, and what to do, and once you finished with your job here, it's also very easy. You just do background, destroy, then you confirm that you really want to destroy it. It will shut it down, it will delete it, and uh, it's gone. Well, the VM image is still cached on the hard drive, but uh, you can also p uh, uh, delete the cache if you want. Okay, let me go back to my presentation. So, it went pretty well, I'm glad. Uh, yeah, and last thing that I'm going to talk about, that I actually learned during all these things is that there are ready-made solutions that are doing exactly this thing. Uh, one is called Container Lab, it uses Docker and it runs uh, basically containerized, uh, uh, containerized routers from real vendors like Nokia uh, in Docker, and you can just uh, design your topology in YAML file, and it will create the topology, and it will, it will uh, run it. Uh, and even on top of it is something called IP Space Net Virtual Networking Labs tool, which is another thing that will basically create vagrant and ansible scripts to set up your networking lab according to your infrastructure as code. So it's even an extra layer on over it. So if you are trying to do something like really bigger, something that will not be constrained by one computer, go ahead and try this instead of starting your own things. But of course, in my case, I cannot run neither on uh, common computers, so uh, so in the end, well, at least I'm thinking this for myself because after wasting all the effort in setting this up, I feel like I feel like this is uh, the reason why I haven't gone for these other solutions. That's everything from me, and feel free to give it a try on academy.tribe.net yourself. Thank you very much. Maybe uh, 10 seconds for one question. 
Have you had feedback from your um, students? Uh, only a few. It seems that either everything is working or nobody is using it. I, I hope that this is the first case. But yeah, we have few complaints, as I said, from people from Middle East have complaints usually that they cannot run it because they, their internet is crap. Uh, but, uh, uh, and we had some, I had some success stories, some personal feedback, but uh, not really that I would have like 100 tickets per month or so. It's like really like uh, only one, uh, once of, of few people that are providing feedback. So if you give it a try and find that something doesn't work or does work, feel free to uh, send, us a, send us a message. We will be really happy to uh, find out whether people are actually using it or enjoying it or thinking maybe it should be something mm, uh, better. Okay, can we do one more? Uh, how long did it take to set all these things up and to figure out what to use and... Oh, figuring out what to use is always hard. So it were, it were months, of course, like doing of something else as well. But like then, then once I get the right direction, it was like iterative process of fixing uh, failures and let's say well like maybe two three weeks and then of course like of course also figuring out with the training material developers who are responsible for the content what actually they want from me how the lab should set up and what is the you know s there are some requirements there is some reality what is technically possible and somewhere in between we, we just meet and this is what we then offer yeah so like this Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.